Hello again and welcome. This is the adult Sunday school lessons for the First Baptist Church of Alabaster. This is the Bible Studies for Life curriculum for Sunday, November the 22nd, 2020. I hope you have your copy of the Word of God and opened up. We're going to be looking at Psalm 99. Um, the title of the lesson is Committed to His Worship. And we'll begin reading at the first verse. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among the, his priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord and he answered them. In the pillar of the cloud he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statute that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Now a distinctive point in Psalm 99 is the holiness of God. Though holiness is a major theme throughout the Bible, many readers have only a vague conception of the meaning of the term. One of the purposes of this lesson is to clarify the meaning of holiness. Now let's consider the word holy. What is the first thought that comes to your mind when you see the word holy? Now to many people holiness is an old-fashioned idea that has something to do possibly with men who wear long robes and sandals and live possibly in a monastery. And maybe that's a stretch a little bit, but sometimes uh, that could be the vision somebody someone may have of holy. The verses we are studying emphasize the truth that holiness is first and foremost a basic attribute of God. But what do we mean when we call God holy? And our les lesson is going to focus on answering that question. Now take note of the psalmist's declaration in verse 3. Holy is he. And verse 9 the Lord our God is holy. The biblical concept of holiness, uh, the, he the Hebrew, is based on the idea of separateness. The verbal form, uh, which is spelled a little bit differently in Hebrew, means to be separated or could mean to be lofty. To separate something is to set apart from other things. But as applied to God, the idea of separation it implies otherness, but not remoteness. That is to say that God's holiness does not mean that he is distant. It means that he is utterly different. In other words, there's nothing like him. Hosea chapter 11 verse 9 expresses the very, this idea very well. For I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee. The often heard reference to God as the man upstairs is inexcusably profane, and it's totally disrespectful. To say the Lord our God is holy is to say that he is separate from or stands apart from. Everything and everyone is created, uh, oh, excuse me, everything and everyone in the created order is separate from God. In other words, he created it. He is in a class by himself, if we can use common language. He is utterly different from all other beings because he is holy. The only possible answer to the biblical question, who is like the Lord our God, 
The answer is no one. And you can look at Psalm chapter 113, verse 5 there. Now, in the midst of thee, uh, Hosea 11, 9, is an important part of the Old Testament concept of divine holiness. The God of the Hebrews was no static deity uh, like the deist or the deists, uh, unmoved mover. In other words, he's not some God or creator way out there and has nothing to do with his creation. He was never thought of by the Hebrews as standing away from the world in splendid isolation. That was never the thought, and it's not our thought in Christianity either. Consider the language in verse 1 and how it relates to how uh, we are to respond to God's holiness. He sits enthroned above the cherubim like the earthquake, or like an earthquake. This wording should remind us of Isaiah's description of his encounter with the holy God in Isaiah chapter 6. reads this way, In the year the, uh, that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting up uh, upon a, a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood seraphim, each had six wings, with two covered their face, and with two the seraphim covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another, say, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now note that God's holiness is associated with his glory. His holiness is manifested by the burning splendor of the presence of the Lord. Now Isaiah 6, 5 reads, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Essentially, what the psalmist means is what Isaiah's response to the exalted vision of the Holy God, let the earth quake in verse 1 has some similarity there with those verses I just read. Now, popular religion today is often characterized by a lack of reverence uh, or a casual attitude, if you will, toward God's holiness. Now, this is just an example. I'm not meaning to come across judgmental, but in a contemporary church, not so far away from here, uh, the minister comes out on a Sunday morning calling out, all right, Let's hear it from all God's cowboys out there. And those present responded with a loud, raucous, Yeehaw! Then a youth minister jumps out from a submerged baptistry and he springs up with water praising the Lord with a great deal of splashing. Now, again, I'm not trying to be judgmental, but I don't think that necessarily helps articulate the holiness of God and worshiping God in a reverent and holy way. But again, that's just me. Looking at verses 2 and 3, Zion, the word Zion in verse 2 stands for Jerusalem. But the Lord is supreme not only over Israel, but also over all the peoples, all the nations. As a result of this fact, all people everywhere will praise his great and majestic name. So it says verse 3. Majestic is uh, synonymous with awe-inspiring. One popular writer uh, from the uh, mid-20th century said about worship, does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power is made available to us? Or as I suspect, does not uh, does no one believe a word of it? It is madness to wear ladies' straw hats or velvet hats to church. We should be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should be issuing life preservers and signal uh, flares. They should lash us to the pews. In other words, there's no greater power than the power of God. And when he is moving in our hearts, there, it is unstoppable. 
Continue with verse, with verse 4. There are three uh, synonymous words in this verse. Justice, and it's used twice. Righteousness, or, and then equity or fairness. All of these terms refer to the qualities that should govern the life of the community of Israel, and I think should uh, govern the lives of us today as God's people. The holy God is concerned with social justice and with morality. So what does this imply concerning God's will for our society today? I hope that you'll strongly consider that. Continuing on verses 6 to 8. These verses recall uh, times of crisis in Israel's history. When three great figures, Moses, Aaron, and Samuel, were leading the nation, and God had answered his people's cries for help. These men of God had prayed, they cried out to the Lord, and God answered them. He answered them from a pillar of a cloud, if you will, in verses 7 and 8 there. Then verse 9, the psalmist's final exhortation. Extol the Lord our God. In other words, exclaim the greatness of Yahweh and worship at his holy mountain. And this most likely was Mount Moriah on which Solomon had built the temple. Anyone who comes to God's holy hill and thus his sacred house to worship should remember the words of David when he asked, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. And we can look at Psalm 24, verses 3 through 4. God is holy. His hill is holy. His people are to be holy. All of this comes in our having a set apart relationship with him. And of course, as believers in Christ, we have the dwelling of the Holy Spirit today, continually. Now, our best possible response to the holiness of God is authentic worship, not entertainment for our fellow uh, believers or seekers, for that matter. Psalm 95, 6-7 tells us, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. And I'm thankful that I'm a part of that flock. There's some additional question uh, that you might want to think about. And what, just to refresh, what does it mean to God, call God holy? And you may want to look at verse 3. But why would this lead someone to worship God? When we realize the holiness of God, what does that, why does that cause you to want to worship God? And we certainly should. And if we are not desiring to worship God, maybe we need to ask ourselves several questions on that. Well, I hope this lesson has been an encouragement to you. I hope it's been challenging. I, again, uh, encourage you to go back and read over uh, Psalm 99 and pray about it, meditate upon God's Word here. And as we prepare for this season of Thanksgiving, I pray that we all exalt God and worship Him in purity and holiness. And may you feel the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ today and the day.